Okay, folks, welcome to another 8-bit face-off kerfuffle. <clears throat> and in this video, we're going to take a look at uh, Puzzler uh, Confusion. Um, this was released, I think it was 1984, possibly. It might have been 1985, but who cares? Um, yeah, released, uh, this was the C64 cover, The Fusion of Mind and Machine. So, let's take a look at some, well, hopefully all of the home conversions. Now, surprisingly, this was actually on the BBC. Now, the joystick, uh, it wasn't a joystick option. So, I'm having to, uh, having to use keys, so this will be interesting. Yet again, it is only up, down, left and right. Now, there appears to be a complete lack of any sound. So, the idea of the game, um, if you're of a certain age, um, a kid of the 70s, even early 80s. Think back to uh, Christmas when you had Morecambe and Wise and you had, you know, come on, and Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Christmas crackers. Um, back then, you would get little, uh, little, in fact, I'm probably talking shite because this would be too big for a Christmas cracker. Yeah, I probably am. But you would have these little uh, sliding puzzles. It was a little, uh, piece of plastic and it was like little pieces that slid along there was a space just enough just exactly what you can see here where you had to slide one along but with that it was usually you had like a number grid one to nine you had to try and put them in order it's like a rubik's cube but flat if that makes any sense so this is kind of along the same premise you uh you don't actually control anything you'll see there there's a little uh thing that's kind of flashing which is a spark here yeah, it is a spark and the idea of the game is you've got to try and uh, you've got to try and defuse bombs which you'll see on the left hand side well there's one there flashing b think have you got a time limit oh yeah now the time limit is actually that little uh that little line at the top you'll see a little uh fuse thing kind of counting down until the bomb explodes. Now the way to get the uh, the spark, what you want to do is detonate the bomb. Presumably you're deton detonating it safely so nobody gets killed. Um, I just managed to do it there through sheer luck. And so yeah, what you do is you just you move the pieces and the idea being you're trying to connect the path from the spark to the bomb and I've just been killed or the spark is just uh, extinguished been extinguished by a drop of water I think that's what that is oh there we go Ooh. I did play this back in the day um, it was quite a frustrating game I think it got quite a good review in Zap if I remember rightly but anyway we're talking about the, the BBC version here um, it's, it's fine graphics are, are functional <clears throat> yeah, I could never really, uh, I just got a bit kind of stressed playing stuff like this. There we go again, that was pure luck. Level 3. Okay, the only way I can really play it is wait for, rather than actually trying to plot out path, is wait for the the spark to move on to the piece that you're going to move. Um, but that's only going to work. You see, that's going to have a dead end. That's not much good. Yeah, for me, it was... It was quite much luck. Uh, that's going to go to a dead end. Oh, move it down. I'm going to move that piece down. And here's the thing, I do, because of different reasons, when my daughter made a lot of noise upstairs, I tend to record the video part 
and then it overlay the commentary secondly. So that's why sometimes I say I'm going to do something and then I don't do it. It's because I'm, I'm talking after the event. That was the BBC. Yeah, very, very nice. Now this is the Amstrad. CPC, think of it as correct title. Again, I mean, graphically, oh, what do these games? Oh, a nice little sound effect. There was a game that I was going to do an 8-bit face-off kerfuffle, which was kind of similar to this. And I just got completely stressed. I couldn't figure out at all. I had no idea what I was doing. And it's a uh, split personalities. Um, similar to this, you move pieces. But again, it's like that sliding puzzle I was talking about that you didn't get in your Christmas crackers. Um, you had to try and build a face, but yeah, too complicated. But we're talking about confusion here. I think it would be very difficult to have a bad version of this. Even the C16. I mean, graphically, I think, am I, am I right in thinking that this is marginally sharper looking, slightly nicer? I'm being really, really picky here, because, I mean, you know, the BBC one was, was a lovely version. We will do a little summary at the end, just to kind of see, but, you know, from a playability point of view, it's exactly the same. Oh, bollocks. why there's no music in this because this is the perfect kind of game for music i'm not generally a fan of music in especially arcade games because like shoot em ups because you need to be able to concentrate unless of course it's rolling thunder then that's different um but for a game like this a nice little tune it wouldn't have gone amiss I find it interesting revisiting games from the past um, because a lot of people get really misty eyed and you know about how wonderful the good old 8 bit uh, games were. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good 8 bit games, but there's a lot that when you look at them now, you think, I don't think I could really be bothered, be bothered playing this now. You know, things were simpler back in the 80s. We didn't have the same choice of games and. Uh, I think we're definitely easier pleased um, back in the back in the day. Oh, bollocks. Yeah, it starts going away off on its own. <laughs> yeah, I just repeated what I did there. I'm really not doing very well at all. Right, that was the Amstrad. This is the ZX Spectrum. This has got a bit of music. Right, eh... Uh... Yep, it's got the, the quintessential little farts and squeaks and squawks that we've come to expect from a 48k spectrum. It's it, it's functional. Graphics are functional. They're not as pretty as either the BBC. Oh, that's quite an impressive sound. Oh, I love that little noise. It's very, very similar to the little uh, timer countdown in Manic Miner. <laughs> yeah, these are these sounds could only be made in a spec. I would love to hear. I would love to see if somebody could convert Spectrum sound effects to Commodore sixty four. That would be a good test. Yeah, color is obviously limited. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the the pink. We yellow, but uh, again, it, it's it's functional.
I'm wondering if they chose not to put music because I mean, it was an early game to be fair, um, and the problem with music, if you put a little chunky music on a game and you can't turn it off, it can be the most annoying thing ever. So maybe having not having music is actually a good thing. Or maybe having the option to have it would have been nice. I don't think this was converted to the MSX. When I do these 8 bit face off kerfuffles, I always check Wikipedia and just see what they came out, uh, what machines they came out on. Because I don't think it came out on uh, on that. It never, never got a conversion to the Amiga and Atari ST or any of the consoles. The thing is, this was probably one of the earliest kind of puzzle games. Um, you know, Tetris came along, you had Columns and Puzzle Bobble and yeah, the, the, the scene became awash with kind of puzzle games. Is this one of the best ones? Mm, probably not, though I'm not really, I'm not a big fan of puzzle games. For me, the only, the only game is Tetris. And the final one. Yep, you know that tune. This is the one that uh, I played back in the day. Commodore 64. Now, the title track was uh, by the legend that is uh, Rob Hubbard. Uh, incidentally, I did buy the oh, what do you call it? The Rob Hubbard uh, Master of Magic book uh, by Chris. I've completely forgot his second name. Dear me, um, awesome! And it's been signed. I wasn't going to buy it because I do have it digitally, and I thought to myself, you know what? It's a beautiful book, but the one that's that I've got signed and. It's, it's nice. I mean, Rob is... There's not many legends in this industry, but Rob Hubbard is 100% one of them. Um, and yeah, Confusion was one of his uh, earliest pieces. Um, you can tell it's an early piece. You know, obviously, his instruments and voices did get better and better and more advanced. Um, but I love the Confusion tune. Um, I somehow thought that it played when you were playing the game. But it doesn't appear to, which is a shame because it would enhance the game. I think the musical track was a big part of why I played this. Played it for the music. The game was all right, um, but it was really more about having oh damn it, having the uh, listen to the music because it was and still is a good piece of music. But yeah, I just find this game game incredibly frustrating. Um, there's probably a technique to it. But the fact that it's bouncing back and forwards, what you should do is let it go on a little loop where it's going back and forwards, but then rearrange, rearrange it all, and then release it. If that makes any sense, can he park the park the spark? Quite <laughs> saying that when you're drunk, and then moving all the other squares so that you know that you're going to be able to yeah, send it on to its final destination. But I think it's uh, I think it's fair to say that you know, 
it wouldn't really matter what uh, what system you had this game on. Um, a good game's a good game. Um, just a pity. Most of them, including the C64, were played in complete silence. Well, bar a few sound effects. Like I say, his memory's a funny thing. I honestly thought that this game had the sound playing. Maybe it does. Maybe it does. I don't have the instructions for the game. Um, I did check to see if there's a button. You know, a lot of the time in C64 games, you'd have the option to turn the music on and off, which is always nice because music can get extremely uh, irritating. Um, I've played games in the past, can't recall off the top of my head what one, what they were, but I've played games in the past where uh, the music would actually get enough to make you not want to play the game. Right, so that little drop of water, that, well, if that comes into contact with the, the spark, then uh, it extinguishes it and you, you lose a life. Another two to go here, I think I'm going to struggle. I'm running out of time as well. Kaboom, there we go. Right, summary time, and I thought this would be a perfect moment to let you listen to that track. Now, top left is the Spectrum version. Bottom left is the BBC one, I think. The top right is the Commodore 64 one. And the bottom right is the Amstrad one. They're all nice. I mean, they all look different. The Spectrum one and the BBC are slightly garish looking. Um, there's not a lot to choose visually between uh, the Amstrad and the C64 in my opinion. Um, I, think, I think the visuals are slightly nicer on the, the Commodore 64. Not a lot to choose, but, you know, there's only going to be one version you're going to want to play. And it's the C64 one, and it's because, nothing to do with the game, because of that stonking track. It was one of the earliest games that I heard when I actually heard a piece of music on the Commodore 64 that I wanted to listen to. I was like, wow, and I would load up the game. Um, I remember speaking to the closer. Um, he bought uh, Miami Vice by Ocean, and the game was complete dog shit, but he bought it because of the sound. Uh, Rob Hubbard, or was it Martin Galway track? and uh, he bought it just to listen to music and this was a game that I would load just because the music was so good. But that said, it's still a fun game to play, you know. Has it aged well? Mm, I don't know, I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's always interesting to take a look at these old games. So, finally folks, I just want to say a huge big thank you for watching. Till next time.